Hey everyone, it's good to be back together with you all for an incredible morning here online. I'm really excited for it because today we get to celebrate baptisms, where people publicly proclaim that they put their faith and trust in Jesus. Baptism is a beautiful picture of being brought from death to life, and I'm ready to celebrate what the gospel continues to do with all of you. Along with baptisms, I'm just excited to continue in Acts and everything else these moments ahead of us are going to hold. I think it's going to be a beautiful morning together. I'd love to start our time this morning with Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Might we be a part of the praising this morning? Let's head over and then I will see you all in just a bit. Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. All right, come on, we can do better than that. I get a commission based on your enthusiasm. Good morning, Christ Chapel. All right, all right, yeah. I'm gonna retire. I wanna welcome everybody in the room and all of those watching online. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us. With us. If this is your first time, second time to be with us at Christ Chapel, we wanna ask you to do a favor. In the seat rack in front of you is a little connect card. If you're online, it's actually a link in the chat. And we ask you to fill this out to give us a little bit of information about you so that we can give you a little bit of information about us. Uh, we also ask that if there's anything you need prayer about, that you fill out the prayer request section. That's for everybody in the room, everybody online, whether you're a long-term Christ Chapelite. We wanna pray with you and for you. We have a team of people who pray throughout the week and so that's really important for us because we're a, a praying church. Also, if you want to know more about who we are and find out what's going on at Christ Chapel, I invite you to go to the website. 
I, I also ask you to look on uh, all the various digital media that we occupy where you can find out all kinds of information about podcasts, past sermons, articles, resources that can help you grow in your faith. Because we want you to grow not only in your faith, but also as part of this local body called Christ Chapel, because we're a family. And speaking of family, now's the time when you get to stand up and greet those sitting next to you. So do that right now. There is none like you. 
our almighty God. You may be seated. Man, I love this song. You know, 
I love the, the imagery in that song about the saints casting down their crowns before God. You know, I, I'm always thinking about, well, I'm going to have a crown. But I think what I'm going to do with that crown is I'm going to give it to the Lord because he made it possible. And really, when we give our offerings, and we're at that time in the service where we recognize the, the need, the obligation to give back to God just a little bit of what he's done for us, that's what we're doing is we're laying down these gifts given to us by God in recognition for all that he's done for us. Here at Christ Chapel, there's three different ways you can give, as you well know. You can text using your phone, text the keyword. You can go online and give that way, or as you leave, you can put your offering in the offering boxes on the way out. But however you choose to give, I pray that you do give and do so joyfully because your gifts do make a difference. We love to tell you about what's happening because of your generosity, because uh, it's an encouragement that we need to continue to give joyfully, sacrificially, because it is changing the lives of people all around the world. About five years ago, we came to you and told you about a situation going on where there was a group wanting to build a church in a predominantly Muslim country in the Middle East. And you gave, and your gifts made possible the completion of that church. And that church now sits on a literal hill and is a literal light to a very dark world, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. It was completed in 2021. And they have made an impact. Not just with the gospel, as important as that is, changing the spiritual lives of people in that community, but also the physical lives of people in that community because there's also a free medical clinic that is available to anybody in that area to come to and get help with physical problems they may have. See, when you give, God does great things and he is transforming the lives of people who are hearing the gospel for the first time because those people who occupy that church, those believers are the hands and feet of Christ taking the good news of Jesus Christ to those who desperately need to hear it. Well, I'm going to ask you to now join me in a time of prayer. This morning, Dr. Bailey's going to unpack the second half of Acts chapter 9, and in that chapter, we're going to see the results of the transformation of the life of the Apostle Paul, who came to faith in Christ and whose life was radically transformed. And one of the things I love about Paul is Paul is always living with what I describe as with his head on a swivel. He's always looking back at where he came from, but he's always looking forward to where he's going. And he never forgot those two. As a matter of fact, he writes to the church at Corinth, and he, and he describes some pretty hideous sins going on. He says, Anybody who regularly indulges in sexual sin, commits adultery, worships idols, steals, cheats, abuses others, or gets drunk will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's not exactly a good news letter, right? And, and I think these people were shocked looking around, well, who, who's he talking about? And I think he, they knew he was talking about them. But then he follows that up with a very good piece of news. He goes, some of you were once like that. And see, that's the reality of what God has done in my life and in your life if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Because Paul goes on and says, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And I want to use those verses as an outline for a brief time of prayer as we go to the Lord and we thank Him for what He has done because we were like that. But if you're in Christ, you no longer are. So would you join me in prayer? Paul reminds us that we have been cleansed. Would you thank God for the cleansing power of the gospel that removes our sins as far as the east is from the west? Thank God for the reality of that truth. Paul states that we have been made holy. Express your gratitude to God that you now stand before him as a saint and not a sinner.
because of Christ's death on the cross, you enjoy a right standing with God. You have been justified in his eyes. Would you ask him to help you live as who you are, as who he sees you, rather than as who you used to be? Now, would you close by thanking God for his amazing grace and the reality that he no longer views you as who you were, but who you have become in Christ. Well, Father, you're a good, gracious, merciful, and loving God who has done for us what we could never have done for ourselves. You've provided us with a means of salvation when we deserve nothing but condemnation. Like Paul, we can remember the days when we were living in open rebellion to you. We were your enemies, but now we're your friends. We were the chief of sinners, but you have transformed us into saints, and you're not done yet. Help us to live with the confidence that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Is it possible that any moment could be holy, Lord? Any moment. These daily moments we view as ordinary and mundane might be better described as one of 10,000 events you use to extend your glory to reach unexpected people in unexpected ways. And when I question, how could you use my life? When my inadequacy stretches like an ocean. You part the seas. Help me see that my life and all of the experiences I've had. Heartaches, the hurts, the happiness, the failures. You've given purpose, meaning, and value. Overflowing my life with living water. Reflecting your light in beautiful, unexpected ways. Help me see the divine in between these moments as I learn to expect the unexpected. Amen. Amen. Expecting the unexpected. Good morning, Christ Chapel. Good morning. I asked permission of Cody and got his permission to uh, be a little bit more relaxed. Got a little tendonitis in one of the legs, and so uh, I'm going to relax, so you relax. Is that all right? It's great to be with you. Get to be with you. I don't know about you, but our, our family loves to play games. When we're on vacation, as we were a couple weeks ago, down on the uh, west end, uh, point west of Galveston, and uh, stay up late night playing, playing board games, playing word games. Uh, we all are sort of into Wordle and uh, the minis and things like that. I, I don't like crossword puzzles, except I like the minis. I'm not smart enough to fill out the big ones. But, uh, but we love playing word games. And uh, so some of the, the word games that we play with our grandchildren, uh, deal with puns or uh, plays on words. Uh, some are like dad jokes, as, uh, which is more popular these days. And so uh, one of the ones that I like is that uh, some thought Cleopatra wasn't very pretty, but that's not how Julius Caesar. <laughs> but one of our uh, fun ones that, uh, to play with, and it really fits our series, is what uh, it's a a term called palindrome, and palindrome comes from two Greek words. One is palin, meaning again. The other is the, the drone part is uh, from the word to run. And uh, it basically means to run again. Well, a palindrome is uh, a word or a phrase or a sentence that uh, when you uh, read it backwards or forwards, it's spelled the same. For example, race car uh, is uh, race car going either way. Kayak, same thing. Rotator is another one. Noon is one. Names are like that, Bob and Anna and Abba. All of those are uh, palindromes, which means they are spelled the same going back and forward. It can be a word or it can be a phrase, uh, never odd or even. That's a whole phrase, never odd or even, spelled backwards is never odd or even. It can be a sentence or a question like, 
Was it a car or a cat I saw? Was it a car or a cat I saw? That's spelled the same going either way. That's a palindrome. As I sit where I normally do back here with my family, uh, and we were introduced to this section of the book of Acts with our series title, Expecting the Unexpected. How do you expect what you don't expect? And it's a little uh, a phrase going back and forth. And uh, when you think about it, uh, and the title of my message this morning out of Acts chapter 9 is expect opposition with unexpected growth. Is expecting growth in the midst of opposition or is it expecting opposition in the course of unexpected growth? And the answer is yes. <laughs> We're going to see that from the text, but ironically, uh, I want to begin with a a very realistic promise that Jesus made. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 9. We'll be in verses 20 through 31. If you don't have a Bible underneath your pew, there's normally a a pew Bible, and it's on page 917. 917. Uh, Welcome to those again of you who are joining us by uh, distance, by technology. Uh, We're delighted that you're a part of uh, what we're doing today, and uh, it's great to have you here in person as well. Ironically, in the midst of the ministry of Jesus, he announced his plan to build the church. Acts is the continuation of what Jesus began to do and to teach, as we saw in Acts chapter 1. This is the second volume of Luke. Luke's gospel and Luke's uh, account in the book of Acts, same author, wrote a, a significant portion of the New Testament as that physician historian that accompanied Paul on his journeys. But Jesus said, and he was talking to Peter, but he was talking beyond Peter, as we'll see, when he says in Matthew chapter 16, 18, I will build my church. Jesus has a plan to build his church. And he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He begins by saying, Peter, you're a rock. You are Petros in Greek. But upon a Petra, that's a collective noun, It's like a foundation of multiple rocks. I'm going to build my church. Some wonder, what is the rock? It's Peter. And the rocks, according to Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says the church has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. So he is a keystone of the whole foundation, but it's Christ working with his disciples, planting the church of Jesus Christ of which we now are part of the superstructure of that as God continues to build it. But I wanted you to see something. Jesus said that he would build his church in a context of opposition. He says, and you need to expect it. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell aren't going to be able to prevail against it. In other words, my church will ultimately be successful. My program with the church will ultimately accomplish my goals. The the gates of hell, the gates are there as the authority structure. Ancient Near East where you have business done in the gates, like in the book of Ruth, where uh, Boaz uh, had to decide, you know, whether he was going to take Ruth or not, or uh, the near kinsman redeemer in there. They met in the city gates. Uh, That's the place of authority. So what Jesus is saying is all the authorities of hell aren't going to keep Jesus from doing his thing. And so uh, the context <clears throat> of the growth of the church and the birth of the church is in a context of opposition, in the context of hostility. The church, as we read in the New Testament, is made up of Jews and Gentiles who share a common faith in Jesus Christ, as well as the miraculous unity in community that's established and only can be explained by the Holy Spirit of God. You and I are from different backgrounds geographically, our sin uh, histories, our family histories, uh, our religious histories, and, and what God chooses to bring a group of us like this in a local church is a demonstration. None of us would be together normally except rallied around the person of Christ and a community of believers that share a like faith and trust in Christ. Uh, what, what a phenomenal miracle. And, and one of the blessings of being a part of this church is the incredible sense of unity, of, of, of fellowship and purpose that God's allowed us to have here. But from its very inception, the church has faced opposition, both from religious as well as secular opponents to the gospel. And for over 2,000 years, it has survived and thrived 
beyond all proportions of those minuscule beginnings of the 12 minus one, another one reelected into it in the upper room with 120 on the day of Pentecost, and from there it spreads like wildfire. Uh, we don't see the growth in the United States as we did in the earlier days. The biggest growth of the church right now is taking place uh, in, in, in phenomenal proportions in the sub-Sahara Africa, in uh, Latin America, in the, in the, in the East, uh, in Asia. Pastor Cody so insightfully observed a couple weeks ago that the expansion of the gospel in these chapters of 8, 9, and 10 uh, included the territories of the, of the three sons of Noah, Ham, Sham, and Japheth. And uh, our passage today comes right in the middle of that, and it lies at the heart of that set of chapters. So you're going to need your Bible, and uh, I'm going to read in a few minutes, and I'm going to ask you to follow along. It won't be on the screen. Some passages will, but some won't. Uh, so it, it, grab that in your, in your notes, and uh, I want you to begin, before I begin reading, I want to show you a paradigm a repeating paradigm that happens throughout the book of Acts, and uh, it's going to show up in the life of Paul in this uh, section here. This pattern of Acts is, is, is a pattern of the whole, where there is, we've been called to be witnesses, as we saw back in Acts chapter 1. You'll be my witnesses, and the uttermost part of the world is the ultimate scope. But there's, when witness happens, then comes reaction. Reaction might take the form of uh, a question, uh, uh, you know, uh, like we saw in Acts chapter 2, are these men drunk? <laughs> it's, a, it's the middle of the day. Why are they speaking like this? Uh, it may be opposition. It may be threat. It, it may be belief by some, opposition by others. But there's witness. Then there's reaction in multiple forms. Then God steps in in a phenomenal way, which is the theme of our series right now that we're in here in Acts, and that is what, what is God, uh, the divine one, doing in the in-between of the expected unexpected nexus? And so uh, God steps in and then we see expansion of the church, growth of the church. Uh, this pattern is found in the whole of the book of Acts, but it's gonna be found specifically here in Paul's life in this chapter, as we'll see. And uh, last week, we were in uh, the conversion of the apostle Paul. His name was Saul. We're going to interchange that. He, he becomes Paul. But we're in that period, if I can say it, between the Saul and the Paul. And there's going to be a reason for that, as we'll see. In chapter 9 and verse 15, if you go back in the text there, Paul was called by the Lord. Are you ready for this? This is not a job description you probably would want to accept, uh, you know, uh, unless it was given to you by God. Paul, you're going to be a one who's going to carry the name of Christ to the Gentiles. Being a Jew, I know that's hard for you, but there you're going to go. And not only that is you're going to have to appear before kings, secular kings, and the rest of the nation of Israel. Now, when you understand those three things, that mission is very intimidating. Because when you are a believing Jew, you have the other unbelieving Jews against you. The Gentiles could care less about you. When you're a Jew testifying to the Gentiles as a Jew, they're not going to be that real thrilled with you. And then you're going to have to stand before kings, many of whom think the world revolves around them, and you're going to have to preach the gospel to them. We're going to find all of that in this passage. But that's not all. Paul, not only, or Saul, not only have you been called to be a, 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 a missionary, a, a, a messenger of that, but also I just want to let you know I've called you, God says, I called you so you would suffer for me. You know, I think I'd like A, but not necessarily B. Now watch that paradigm right there, because in miniature, Luke now introduces us to Saul's mission and suffering in two examples, one in Damascus, and one in Jerusalem. And then we're not going to hear about Paul until after God's done with Peter and the boys in this opening section until Paul picks up the gospel and takes his missionary journeys in the future. So first in Damascus, then in Jerusalem. Look at the text with me as I read Acts chapter 9, verse 20 to 25. I'll read the first portion. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus. Notice, Saul, who just now found Christ, immediately goes and proclaims Jesus in the synagogues, saying, now watch this, he, Paul gets it now, he is the Son of God, second person of the Trinity. Now you know that didn't go over well in the synagogue, that Jesus, the one who was crucified, 
because he claimed to be God, he claimed to be equal with God, he claimed to be the king, he claimed to be the savior of the world. He is now, Paul is saying, here's Jesus and he is the son of God. By the way, this is the only time that phrase is used in the whole of the book of Acts. And I think Luke wants us to know right up front, Paul gets it. If you want to know whether his conversion was real, he gets it. He is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed. (laughs) Notice the reaction saying, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for that purpose to bring them bound before the the chief priest? That's what we saw in the top part of chapter 9. That's where he was going was to Damascus with papers to arrest believers, take them before the courts in Jerusalem to be persecuted or imprisoned by the courts. Isn't this the guy that did that? And the answer isn't given here. It says, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Now, don't miss this. He's not only the Son of God, he's also the Messiah, the Christ. There's an interesting construction here in the original language. The word by in front of the word proving in our text is not there. Uh, It's understood to some degree, but there's something even more, I think, important here. If I could read it literally, it says this, but Saul was strengthened much and confounded the Jews living in Damascus, proving Jesus was the Christ. You say, what's the difference between that? Proving Jesus was the Christ did two things. One, for Paul, it continually strengthened him. Paul was strengthened, proving Jesus was the Christ. Paul confounded the Jews, proving Jesus was the Christ. Both of those were the results. Now, why is that important? Here's the insight for you and for me. The better that we get in explaining the gospel, the more we understand what God gave us in his word, the more times we share it in different contexts, the more meaningful it becomes and the more growth results in our lives. It, it's, it's like, you know, uh, repetition is the mother of learning. And so the more we understand, the more we read our Bible, the more it sinks in, the better we grow and we get strengthened in the in, inside. It's not he's lifting weights in the gym at, at Damascus. He's gaining spiritual strength, understanding how to prove to a Jewish audience that Jesus is the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? Now take a look at the map. Last time we saw this map, but we've added an additional loop. And there's a reason for that. And that is because uh, uh, what we have in Acts chapter 9, Saul starts in Jerusalem. He's going to Damascus to persecute the Christians. He finds Christ on the road to Damascus, and then later he comes back to Jerusalem. But what Galatians adds in chapter 1 of Galatians, verses 15 to 17, is that while he's at Damascus, he takes a trip over to Arabia and then comes back. And in fact, he spends almost three years there before he goes back to Jerusalem. Now, the question is, why is the word many days in verse 23? It says, when many days have passed, how can many days result in three years? I'll come back to that. But what was happening with him in Arabia? Listen to Paul from Galatians. But when he, and I love Paul's testimony here, he, in Galatians chapters 1 and 2 is his spiritual uh, uh, autobiography, if you want to go back and read it. And at this point in time, he says this. Watch his theology in, in his testimony. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult anyone. And what he's arguing in Galatians is, I didn't get this from anybody. God gave me this and confirmed this to me. He said, I didn't consult anyone, okay? Nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. In other words, I'm not in this thing by proxy. This is personal to me. I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Caiaphas, uh, or Cephas, excuse me, which is Peter, and remained with him 15 days. How how can many days be translated as three years of length of time? Well, our Bible helps us interpret our Bible. Look at 1 Kings. Just jot this note in your your notes if you want. 1 Kings chapter 2. I'll show it to you on the screen. It's uh, Shemai, the servant of David, said to the king, 
He says, uh, what you say is good. As my Lord the King has said, so I, your servant, will do. So Shemai lived in Jerusalem many days. No, notice, but it happened at the end of three years that two of his servants, it says, two of Shemai's servants ran away to Achish and to Makkah, king of Gath. Many days, how long is that? Three years. Same basic kind of a concept. I think it's a colloquialism. We, we like say like the day after tomorrow or, you know, uh, and, and other expressions of time when uh, it, it, it seems like it's not a big time, but it's a, a whole thing. We do it in history. We say, uh, when the day comes that this happens, you'll know this. And, and we're not thinking of a single day. We're thinking of a whole progress of time. Uh, you find it also in 1 Kings 18.1, if you want to write that down. After many days, same word in Hebrew, yamin rabim is the Hebrew phrase. The word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. <laughs> how, how many days? Many days. How many? Three years. So our scriptures help us with that. So after uh, th three years. Now, what was Saul doing spending such amount of time in uh, Arabia? Well, let me suggest he was attending DTS. I'm not kidding. Not Dallas Theological Seminary, Desert Theological Seminary. When you read his biography, when you read his autobiography, God took him over there. And, and in fact, if you do the chronology from Acts as well as Galatians, there's about a 14 year period from Paul's conversion to before he begins his missionary journeys and has the impact in the world that he has. Now, why was that significant? Because Paul knew, having grown up, what the Old Testament said. What he did not know is that it referred to Jesus. He knew what the prophecies were, but they were vague and unclear as to when the fulfillment was. And in fact, just like today, Jews that don't believe in Jesus are still expecting, the Orthodox ones, are still expecting Messiah sometime to come in the future. But since Jesus showed up to Paul, or Saul, on the road to Damascus, he knows that Jesus is no longer dead. He is living, and he's the Lord, and he's preaching him as Son of God and the Messiah. And so I think, and this is just me, but I take what he's doing over there is God's putting all of that together for him. On the back of your sermon notes, there's about 22 Old Testament prophecies that find their fulfillment in Jesus. I really think Paul is working his way through the scriptures again, understanding what Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost and in chapter two and chapter three and what Stephen did in chapter seven is how does all of that Old Testament history, all the ages and pages of the Old Testament come into fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Because Paul will link his message again to the Old Testament scriptures and to the life of Christ over and over. So I'm a professor, so that's your homework. Work your way through those passages. It's an amazing study, as you'll see. See, even Saul, who had become the apostle Paul, needed adequate time of preparation to be effective in that mission of evangelism and church planting. But let's continue in our text. Look at verse 23. And many days had passed, the Jews plotted uh, to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him away by night and let him down through the, an opening in the wall and lowered him in a basket. As somebody who grew up in Sunday school and church, I had the incredible fortune of having believing parents. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that was one story I remember on a flannel graph and in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in what we called quarterlies back then. And it, it's a picture of Paul being let down in a basket. Uh, this artist is great. They just should have read the text a little closer. Because when you compare this passage in 2 in, uh, in Corinthians, he was let down through a window, not off the top. But that's okay. It's a great picture. Still gets the point. But listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. At Damascus, this is in, when Paul is chronicling all that he had to go through. He says, at Damascus, the governor under King Eratos was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Isn't that great? He's out of there. They got him out of there, whisked him away, and now he comes down to Jerusalem. So the second half of our text reads this way. And, so, and when he had come to Jerusalem, 
he attempted, in the text, the tense of that in the Greek text is over and over, he attempted to join the disciples. Notice, he's coming down to witness. He's been witnessing, he's been preaching. He gets kicked out of Damascus, so to speak. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Now, understand what Pastor Cody was telling us. Many of the people who he's encountered now here in Jerusalem, some of their relatives have been arrested. Their mom or their dad, their son or their daughter, their friends have been arrested and persecuted and thrown in prison by Saul as he persecuted the church. And so we would naturally be a little suspicious and have problems of credibility when he comes back. But Barnabas, I love this, he has a a key role in the book of Acts, especially in the life of of Saul, Paul. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, in other words, he, he had an encounter with God, who spoke to him and now declared them, and he says, and now, excuse me, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out, which means they accepted him, and here's the fellowship and, and, and back and forth. So he went in and out among the Jerusalem and preaching boldly the name of the Lord, and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. That's an interesting, Luke picks that same word up. Dispute is the same word that was used of Stephen in his confrontation with the Hellenists, okay? When Saul held his robes while he was stoned. So here's Paul going through what Stephen had gone through with the Hellenists. And they're seeking to kill him. And when his brothers learned of this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away off to Tarshish. So we complete our our geography of our map. Again, you're gonna see, like we saw in Damascus, we see it here, in miniature, in the life of Paul, but it's the basic same message in the whole of the book of Acts. There's witnessing, there's reaction, there's amazement, a belief, hostility, there's divine protection, and there's expansion. So with these two paragraphs, what can we learn? What can we take away? Well, very quickly, number one, The identity and authority of Jesus is the core of the gospel message. Jesus, Son of God, Christ and Lord. Jesus speaks of his saving activity. All these terms are used by by Saul in his preaching. That speaks of his saving activity. The Son of God speaks of his essential deity. He is the second person of the Trinity. Christ is a functional ministry term, speaks of his functional ministry, especially in relation to Israel as the fulfillment of all of the promises that they were expecting from Genesis 3, 15 onward. And Lord is a term of royal authority. Revelation will pick that title up later, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In other words, he is the supreme one. He's Lord of the church, he's head of the church. You see, this set of titles and what they represent sets Christianity apart from all other beliefs, isms, and religions of the world. When you understand that God has provided one person to be the Savior, it's the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God who became flesh, to live, to die, to be resurrected, to be ascended, and ultimately coming again. He is the ultimate fulfillment of all that God has promised. He is the anointed one, God's anointed and he deserves the loyalty for us to follow him as Lord. That's a huge package in terms of the core of Christianity right there. Number two, principle number two, questions of credibility are to be expected and provide opportunities for witness. Questions of credibility are expected and provide opportunities for witness. If you look at verse 13, 21, and 26, We see questions, fears, and doubts about the very character and motives of Saul. Last week we heard that Ananias was at first reluctant until the Lord said, hey, this is my doing. You go go to Brother Saul. In Damascus, the Jews were questioning in his previous conduct of persecution. Can't figure out how can he go from that to now being a proclaimer. In Jerusalem, it was the believing disciples that were fearful and doubtful. 
Back up in Damascus, God used Ananias to authenticate Saul's conversion. In Jerusalem, God used Barnabas to intervene and authenticate him with the believing community there. Just think of the miraculous turnaround in Saul's life, from persecutor to preacher, from antagonist to an apostle, from the hunter to the hunted, from one who needed papers in order to extradite believers back down to Jerusalem, he becomes one who writes papers called epistles to pastors and churches all over the Mediterranean world. One of the greatest arguments for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the conversion of Saul. How do you explain Saul's conversion unless the resurrected Lord? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? <laughs> and Jesus manifests himself to him. What a phenomenal turnabout. Number three, differing contexts will require differing approaches in declaring and defending the faith. In this passage, in verse 20, 22, 27, 28, 29, you have five different terms for what witness is required in that sp specific location or that specific circumstance. There's times that Christ needs to be proclaimed. There's times that... Uh, you, you want to raise the question of how do you not see this? You confound. There's proving, which is a, a, an interesting Greek term, which means to, to link and to knit the, you know, link the dots together, link the threads together. There's preaching boldly, announcing openly, and there's disputing at times. You say he's not the Messiah, I say he is the Messiah. How do you know he's the Messiah? Glad you asked. <laughs> and so, Witnessing, and, and one of the things, if you read through the book of Acts and underline all the different ways the word of God gets communicated, there is a, a glossary of terms that lets you know that witnessing takes all kinds of forms in all kinds of circumstances, and all you're doing is clarifying who is Jesus and how can Jesus affect your life. So sometimes you'll just be preaching or teaching it here, let me tell you what this means. At other times you'll say, no, you said Jesus is not God, then why does he command worship? And there's an apologetics element to it. Apologetics is not only presentative, it's also a defense in a right sense of that term of the faith. Declaring and defending, it all happens. Number four, what I love about this one is that as we read through this text and others, God is sovereign and can be trusted to give wisdom as to when to stand firm or when to escape. In Acts, you see warning, arrest, deliverance of some and martyrdom by others. You see, there are times when God miraculously intervenes and delivers his people. We see that in the Old Testament with Joseph and with Daniel and Esther, etc. But here in the New Testament, in Acts, we have what Peter and John in the early chapters, Paul and Silas, we'll see it in chapter 16. But there's other times, listen carefully, there's other times when God allows the persecution and even violent death of martyrdom. And uh, what God has done with martyrs in the history of the church has been phenomenal. Just read Fox's Book of Martyrs if you want to. But here in the text, the example of Stephen in Acts 6, what did that do to embolden the believers when Saul began to persecute him? The church began to spread and so did the church begin to grow. We'll see it in, in Acts chapter 12, James, one, one of the, the leaders of the church of Jerusalem, is killed. Why, why does God allow that and deliver others? That's a part of God's wisdom that we'll only know when we get there. There's other times when God uses natural means, like a basket out of the wall, uh, advocates and allies to facilitate the growth of his church. There are times when uh, smuggling Bibles behind the Iron Curtain w was so necessary and so important. And, and like these examples in this section, Saul threw a wall at Damascus and some other brothers in Jerusalem. Sometimes God will just want you to escape and move on for a better opportunity. Just, my mind is weird. It just reminds me of the old lyrics of Kenny Rogers. You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. You, know, need to, you, know, you don't need to know when to hold them, when to fold them, when to walk away and when to what? Run. Now, if you read the Old Testament, you read the New Testament, there's some humor when at times, in, in some of the strangest ways, God delivers his people. In life, the, the life of David is an example. 
Daniel, the lion's den. Who was that fourth guy in the furnace? Uh -huh. <laughs> we know. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn, but we know. In the lion's den with Daniel. Uh, you know, in the, in the furnace with the three sons of, of, of Israel and, the, and, and Daniel in the lion's den. You know, he doesn't even, it, it doesn't even, you know, they don't even have the smell of smoke coming out. And God shuts the mouths of the lions. But there's other times God says, get out of here. And in fact, in the, in the life of Jesus, he says, don't throw your pearls before swine. It's a pretty blatant statement. In other words, don't waste unnecessary effort when you're in the face of rejection. Do, do the best you can, but there's a time which you need to say, you know what, you're not listening, I, I, I gotta go. You know, there's, there's other things God may want you to do. That takes the wisdom of the Lord. That leads us to our last verse. And one of the biggest points that I want to make this morning, and that is this. In verse 31, he gives us one of those concluding statements. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. This is a loaded verse. You'll see in your notes a whole series of references. We don't have time to read those. I have them all in my notes if I'd had time, but I don't have time. But if you read all of those, it is a pattern of multiplication, addition and multiplication of the church. It, it is a big growth theme throughout the book of Acts. How does the church get birthed, expand? And here he gives us, it's expanded right now to the region that's of the opening chapters of Acts, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. We're starting to fulfill the Acts 1-8 commission. We just have left the uttermost part of the world, and that's what the last half of the book of Acts is going to be about. What are they doing? It, it, it had peace. God protected it. It was being built up. But the two keys to it being multiplied are huge. And that's the... Uh, unexpected and expected nexus that we have here at the bottom of your notes. What was the key to their growth and the multiplication? It was the fear of the Lord, and it was the uh, comfort of the Holy Spirit. See, I think that's the secret to church growth anywhere, but it's a secret of what God has done at Christ Chapel. A, a fear of the Lord is a, an incredible loyalty to who God is and to what God has said. And the comfort of the Spirit is uh, in, in times of stress, in times of crisis, throughout this book, in that nexus of expected growth or expected opposition, or the unexpected growth and the unexpected opposition, you have uh, God at work. And it's a reliance upon the comforting work of the Spirit of God. It's a loyalty to the Lord and a loyalty to his spirit. Now I'm a professor and I have an assignment for you. Sometime this week I want you to go online and, and I want you to put in, and if you went to UT you'll forgive me for a moment, Oklahoma softball team shocks the world. That's the phrase. Oklahoma softball team shocks the world. Some way, somehow, God <clears throat> has been doing a phenomenal work on that, that, that baseball team that won the world, or the, the series, the College World Series. And this little video will have some commentary to it by a, 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 a blogger, a, pre, a, a Christian blogger. But there's three players and the coach sitting on the screen, as you'll see it. And they give testimony of what God has done on that team, which is a phenomenal work of the Lord. And they were talking about how do you keep the joy? And they were explaining joy is uh, from the Lord. Happiness is based on circumstances, but joy of the Lord is our strength. This isn't the end of it. Winning or losing isn't the end of it. This isn't even our home. Our home is in heaven, and that's where we're ultimately going. And then one of the ladies named Alyssa Brito, you'll want to watch this. She used an illustration that became a bit of a gesture among the team this year. I mean, amazing. She said, we have a gesture and it's eyes up. And this was her gesture, it's eyes up, which means we keep our eyes on the Lord. They gave the clearest testimony of the gospel, the power of God, of what he does, winning or losing. What's more important is your relationship with the Lord. I love that. 
talk about effective witness, that just reached that one little clip that's a few minutes long has already reached a half a million people. Who would have thought, eyes up, pointing people to Christ, that little gesture, that little comment could reach a half a million people. You never know what God will do. One of the great things that we get to watch here at Christ Chapel is that loyalty to the scriptures and that loyalty to the Lord and a reverential awe of the Lord, first key. Second key is a dependence and a comfort that comes knowing the Spirit of God is at work. On that little chart of verses, this last week I just decided to take my Bible afresh and I read through the first nine, 10, 12 chapters and I took down the references. There's 12 times in those chapters where they're facing question, rebuke, arrest, disrespect, death. 12 times right alongside all of this growth language that's going on. You'd almost think God was in charge. <laughs> eyes up, fear of the Lord, one eye, and the other eye, comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love how you work. In the times uh, we confess that we take our eye off the mark and away from your word and we forget what you're doing. You, you are about what your son committed himself to, which was to build the church. He's not dead. He's still active. He's still saving unlikely and unlovely people like us and bringing us into a community of faith where we can grow, called out of the world to be sent back into the world. Thank you for examples of clear testimony in the scriptures and even in our own lives, even on a YouTube video. Thank you for the boldness of pointing people to Jesus. It encourages us to be bold and not ashamed. Lord, you are a realist. You said it's gonna come. You're gonna do the church in the midst of hostility. Jesus said, don't marvel. The world hated you, it hated me first. Thank you for that realism, but also thank you for the promise, that paradigm, and that incredible growth pattern. May you encourage us with that. And Lord, if there's one who has not yet trusted in your son as the son of God, the savior, the Messiah, the Lord, may they simply say yes, Lord Jesus, I want you to be in my life. I welcome you by faith. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe and trust what you did, you did for me. And thank you that you'll use that decision to change lives and maybe many lives as you multiply that effect. We commit ourselves to you afresh today in Jesus' name, amen. The hymn writer described that eyes up loyalty to God in this way. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Would you stand as we close by singing Like a River Glorious together. Let's sing. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace over all victorious in its bright increase. Perfect yet it floweth fuller every day. Perfect yet
let's sing that chorus together. Stayed upon together. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Well, if you're not familiar with Christ Chapel, we are a group of people who were sinners and have been made saints because we know Jesus, the Christ, the Lord, the Son of God. And if you'd like to know more about him and more about Christ Chapel, we invite you to step out these doors and go to a booth that has a screen above it that talks about next steps. We'd love to tell you more about our Savior, about our Lord, the Son of God who has transformed our lives just as he transformed the life of Paul. If you need prayer for anything, I'll be down here along with some of the other pastors and prayer warriors, and we'd love to pray with you, come alongside you, and we consider it a privilege and an honor. So may you go out these doors today and be the salt and light we've been called to be. May you multiply the kingdom of God as you live in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the fear of the Lord. You're dismissed. It's been a great morning and we're thankful to have been a part of it with you all. If there's something we can be praying for before you go today, let us know there in the chat or you can let me know using the info that's gonna show right after this. We'd love to pray for you, so just let us know how best to do that. Hope you all have a great week and we'll see you next time.